Well, uh, what we're going to do next, uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking um, just how we can start to work with um, what we think God is saying to us, how we can learn to discern and know, is this him? Is it just my thoughts? How can we, how can we weigh and test the things that we think that we're hearing? Uh, but there's, there's a, a powerful thing that we again see in the arc of scripture that is normal for us. And it's number 10, the gift of prophecy. And when you hear the P word, <laughs> when you hear somebody say prophecy, usually the room will immediately like splinter into three groups. You'll have some people here in the room and they'll be like, all right, he's going to talk about prophecy. Let's get weird, right? You know, you're like, you're all about it. Uh, so that's maybe one group. Another group would be like, hmm, prophecy, prophecy. You know, I'm pretty unfamiliar uh, with that. Uh, I know I've read about it in, in scripture, uh, and I know that there are people in the body of Christ who say they experience that and they have that gift, but I really don't have a whole lot of experience uh, don't know a whole lot about it. And then maybe there's a third group where it's just like, man, there's no way uh, prophecy doesn't exist today. The only way that God speaks today is through the Bible. And so I, I want to say this about prophecy is that scripture can tell you about your beliefs, but we need the active speaking voice of God to tell us about our story. He wants to speak to us about our story and our lives in real time. And that's what the New Testament calls prophecy. So the foundation of our lives is scripture, but the shape of our life is prophetic, according to the New Testament. We have a God who has never stopped speaking in the present, just like he's spoken in history, and he'll never spot, stop speaking to us and through us to one another. Now, here's what I want to do is define what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about New Testament prophecy. So it's this, to hear and speak God's voice on behalf of an individual or group. And so what I want to do is we start to think of this idea of hearing God's voice, this voice of the Spirit in my thoughts, and then I share that with an individual or I share that with a group. I want us to do a journey through the arc of the Bible and just see the Spirit's activity in the Old Testament and how he's working today in the New Testament. So to see the Spirit's activity, we actually have to go all the way back to the first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, here's where he first shows up in the biblical story. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And verse 3 tells us, and God said. God spoke. And when he spoke, his words were active. Now, the word for spirit here, the spirit of God, uh, in the Hebrew, it's the ruach of God. <laughs> I don't do Hebrew very well, uh, but it's the ruach of God that, that is translated as the breath of God, the voice of God, and the spirit of God kind of all wrapped up together. And so, so we see the spirit of God, God breathing through the spirit life into existence, life in creation. So the Spirit's active in creating, and then you see God forming Adam out of the dust or the dirt of the earth, and then it says God breathes into him, his spirit, and Adam became alive. He became a living person. So the Spirit of God brings life um, as God is breathing. So you see this in the very beginning, uh, very first page of the Bible, God is actively breathing, he's speaking, and then what you continue to see is God keeps on breathing and speaking. So you can look in, in Genesis, a couple chapters later, it talks about God, he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day, 
So he's in the garden of Eden and he's having communication and fellowship with Adam and Eve. He's talking. There's two way communication. We've already talked about some of these characters. You see him talking to Noah and Enoch and Abraham and his descendants. Then you get to Moses. And Moses is a really interesting character in the Old Testament. I think, I think Moses really points to a, so many things in the New Testament. It says that God would talk to Moses, it says face to face, as a man would speak to his friend. And, and I believe, you guys, that this is something that God wants for all of us, is he wants intimacy with us and relationship with us. And if you remember, there's a story in Numbers chapter 11 where you have Moses and you have the 70 elders of Israel. They go up on the mountain of God. And so they're on the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and it says that the glory of God descends down on the mountain like a cloud and God is talking to Moses and he's talking to these elders. He's speaking to them. I want you to see uh, what happens here uh, in Numbers chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 25 and then 29. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and he spoke with him and he took some of the power of the spirit. So here again, we see the Holy Spirit in action. And so that was on Moses. And it says he takes that spirit and puts it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. And so they start speaking and declaring as the spirit enabled them, the breath of God enabled them. They're just declaring the wonders and the glory of who God is. They're prophesying to each other. This is, this is the prophetic in community. And it shows up here in Numbers chapter 11. But it says that this, this communal experience of prophecy, it said they did not do so again. So what they received in Numbers through the Holy Spirit was temporary. But what we see God's heart, this is looking forward to the New Testament, to us today, God's heart, we see Moses express it in verse 29. He says, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. So he's saying, I just want everybody to have the gift of prophecy. And again, what is prophecy? Prophecy is, is God placing his words and thoughts in our minds, and we're sharing them with individuals or with groups. And Moses is saying, I want everybody to be able to do this. Let's go forward to the New Testament. John chapter 20 and verse 20, this is a cool verse here, and I want you to see the parallel here between uh, this encounter with Jesus and Genesis chapter 1. It says in John 20, 22, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What is this like a reenactment of, you guys? This is him creating and putting the breath of the Spirit into Adam and bringing life and so Jesus is really just, he's going, you guys, you are the new creation in me. And so I'm going to breathe life, the Holy Spirit, into you. And, and he's going to bring you his life. And, and so he did this in, in John chapter 20. And those disciples, they received something temporarily that they would receive permanently when we get to Acts chapter 2. But hold on. What Jesus is, is doing here in saying, I am, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. This is a fulfillment of a prophecy back in Joel chapter 2. Again, God speaking to a human prophet. And God makes a promise. And, and it's, it's, it's the fulfillment of what Moses was desiring all the way back in Numbers chapter 11. And he's saying this is what's going to happen. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And afterward... I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women. So this is everybody is included. I will pour out my spirit in those days. What are the days? These are the days after the resurrection of Jesus. These are the days that Joel is looking forward to. It's the fulfillment of Moses' desire uh, that was put in him by the Spirit. And so, so what Jesus is bringing 
is the common experience for all people, for all believers, common experience, everyone, all who receive me get my voice, is really what this is saying. All who receive me get my voice. And so Paul's, I'm sorry, Joel's prophecy uh, then becomes Acts chapter 2. What happens in Acts chapter 2? This is at the day of Pentecost, where it says the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. It's like the breath of God. Do you see it? He comes like a mighty rushing wind. And it said that as the Holy Spirit came and filled them, they started to prophesy. They started to speak the wonders of who God was in different languages. Uh, it was a really incredible uh, sign and miracle to all the peoples that were gathered there in Jerusalem. Uh, so they're just, they're walking in the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. And then Paul gives instructions. So what Joel 2 is for, foretelling and it, what's happening in Acts 2, then Paul elaborates on in 1 Corinthians 14. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 and 3. So Paul tells the church, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. And so we're to follow the way of love. This is the way of Jesus. We're loving God passionately. We're loving people tangibly. That's great. But Paul says, you guys, you need more. What I want you to do is eagerly desire spiritual gifts. And we're going to talk about what that means to eagerly desire them, especially to prophesy. Why? What's so special about prophecy? Well, it's right here in verse 3. It says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. How many of us need strengthening, encouragement, comfort? You need the gift of prophecy. You need the gift of prophecy active in your life. You need people around you who are active in the gift of prophecy to speak to you and to share with you. Um, so what Paul does is he's in this whole chapter. I'm not going to go and teach the entire chapter. I would if we had time. But the, the entire chapter is an echo of Numbers 11. Because what Paul is going to say later in this chapter, he's like, I want, I, I desire every single one of y'all to prophesy. Like, I want this to be the norm for all people. It sounds just like Moses. He's like, I want God to put his spirit on everybody to prophesy. Paul says the same thing. He's like, I want every believer to, to prophesy. And so you go, well, yes, all believers Yes, all believers, because we all have the Holy Spirit, and now we permanently carry what the Old Testament prophets carried temporarily. We carry it permanently. And that's why it's called prophecy in the New Testament, because it's the ordinary expression of what was extraordinary before Jesus. And, and so prophecy is not just some optional subpoint in the plot. It's like, ah, prophecy, whatever, not a big deal, I'm not sure. It's not an optional subpoint. It's at the heart of what God is doing in human history. It, it's, it's one of his ways, one of his methods. It's one of the ways the Spirit speaks, encourages, strengthens, and comforts us. And any theology today that says that God does not speak through prophecy today is not built on Scripture. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say that strongly. Any theology that denies that God speaks today through prophecy is not built on scripture. I believe what it's built on is personal experience. Because there are people today, whole denominations, whole, whole kind of sections of the body of Christ who go, you know, we, we don't really believe in that stuff. God stopped doing that stuff a long time ago. Um, but usually when you get underneath it, they're speaking from personal experience. What they're saying is, I've never experienced it personally, so I think God's not really into that today. But they're not speaking biblically. Because here we have in 1 Corinthians 14 an entire chapter devoted to how to use the gift of prophecy and use it well. To use it in a way that is constructive and it builds up, which is what it's designed to do. And so there's an assumption in 1 Corinthians 14 behind this chapter that when God's people gather, God's going to be speaking to us in community through each other. 
And the way God's going to speak to us in prophecy is different than teaching. And I'm going to get to that here in just a little bit, the difference between prophecy and teaching. Uh, and so if, if you're like, does the whole New Testament kind of elaborate on this? Yes, the New Testament writers give instructions for the health, healthy use of prophecy in Romans, Corinthians, Thessalonians, letter to Timothy, to Jude, and in Revelation. So this was the common biblical expectation. I really love what uh, author and philosopher Dallas Willard had to say uh, about this biblical expectation. I'm just going to read this to you. It says, if, he said, if we look at the instructions on how the meetings of the church were supposed to proceed as given in 1 Corinthians 14, we see that they assumed that numerous people in the congregation were going to have some kind of communication from God, which they would be sharing with others in the group. So it was just assumed that this was just going to be a regular part. When the church is gathered, this is, this is what's going to be going on. But the big question is, how do you learn to recognize when it's the Spirit putting His thoughts in your thoughts? Anybody ever had that question? And you're like, yeah, we're hoping you'll answer that one. Okay. That's <laughs> why, it's why we, we paid the big bucks to come to this class, right? Okay. Let's do a little experiment. Could you guys do something with me? I want you uh, right now just to close your eyes. So everybody close your eyes. And now what I want you to do is I want you to identify the voice that you hear speaking to you right now. So identify the voice that you hear speaking to you right now. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. All right, whose voice did you hear? Okay, you heard mine. That was my voice. Well, how do you know? How do you know it's my voice? Well, because you know my voice, which is interesting, uh, because most of you have been following Jesus a lot longer than you've been listening to my voice teaching. But you know my voice, so you can recognize it, right? Some of you, you, you haven't heard me for long. Maybe it's the first time you've just been listening to me for the last hour. Um, but you've been following Jesus a lot longer than you've been hearing my voice teach. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 4. After he's gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. His sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Anybody a sheep of Jesus here tonight? Okay. So if you've been following Jesus longer than you've been listening to me, then you should be familiar with Jesus' voice. Right? But learning... To listen to his voice takes a different sort of practice than it does learning to, to listen to me and be able to identify my voice. It takes a different sort of practice. And I want to say this about, about practicing and becoming familiar is, is that there can be mistakes that sometimes occasionally occur. Uh, but here's the thing, when it comes to, to learning to recognize the voice of the Spirit in our thoughts, the only way we learn is to risk obedience. The only way we learn is to risk obedience to what we think God might be saying to us in our thoughts. And it's risky, isn't it, you guys, if you've ever tried to do this? Awkward, uncomfortable. Yeah, and as many times as you get it right, uh, there are times where you don't. It's kind of like I heard a story about a guy. Uh, he's on a subway, and he's, he's got like this long, this long uh, ride, and he felt like God was saying, I have a word for this person, who this, this lady who's sitting across the aisle from you. I have a word that I want you to share with her. So he waits until there's one minute left in the ride <laughs> uh, before he finally gets up the courage uh, to talk to her. And, and he goes up to her and he says, ma'am, uh, this might be really weird and it's kind of awkward, but I think God is um, sharing something with me that he wants to tell you. And she goes, he's like, can I share it with you? And she's like, yeah, go ahead. 
and he, and he shares it with her and it had something to do about work and career and something like that. And he, and he shares it with her and he goes, uh, does that resonate with you? And she goes, not at all. I don't even work in that industry. He's like, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and he gets off the train, right? <laughs> you know? And it's like, man, sometimes uh, that can happen. And in a community that is trying to learn to, to walk with the Spirit, hear His voice on behalf of others and share it, we have to actually have a humility and kind of a, what I call a kindly humor about ourselves. We need to learn to be able to laugh at ourselves. Like that, that guy's probably like, that was awkward. Oh my gosh, I missed it. Um, where, where it would be a mistake is if he goes, I can't hear God and I'll never attempt anything like that again. That would be a mistake. And so to learn to recognize God's voice and be familiar with it, we have to be willing to get it wrong if we're ever going to get it right. And we also have to learn that a word that is offered in love and humility, we have to believe that it's not going to destroy someone if it doesn't exactly hit the bullseye. It's not going to destroy someone. Now, if you go to somebody and you go, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, and you just drop this thing on them, you know, and, and it's just like you're speaking with this heavy, authoritative whatever. Um, I think that can be damaging. And uh, I, I'm all about if God has a word that I think he's showing me, I'll go to somebody and say, hey, I think that God might be saying because it's coming through a human filter. And sometimes it could get a little bit jumbled in translation. Sometimes I can miss it, but I don't believe people are going to be destroyed uh, if it's offered in love and humility. Um, but I've got, to, I've got to take risks. I'll give you an example. So in our, in our deeper uh, discipleship intensive that we do at New Heights, uh, we have two weeks where we talk about, as a part of our apprenticeship to Jesus and learning to follow him, we talk about how Jesus followed the Holy Spirit perfectly. He just was following the Spirit. He's, God would just show him things, say things to him, and that's what he did. And he followed the Spirit's lead perfectly. And so we, as we talk about following Jesus, we talk about who is the Spirit, how does he speak. Uh, it's very similar to this class and what we're going to do next week. And what we're going we're to do next week um, is we are going to take some time to ask the Holy Spirit uh, to give us encouragement for each other. And so I was doing this uh, this last fall in a group that I was helping to lead a deeper group. And there was a gal in my small group, because we usually do this, we break into groups of, you know, four or five people. Uh, and I had a gal in my group. And uh, this usually doesn't happen to me. Uh, I, you know, we, we pray and we go, Lord, is there anything you want to say for, for uh, her? And um, we usually get quiet for a minute, see if anything comes to mind. Usually God gives me scripture for people. It's just one of the ways that, that he communicates with me is I get a lot of scripture for other people. And I rarely get what happened this night. Uh, I go to be quiet and see if anything comes to mind and a whole movie scene just goes off in my mind. And I mean, it's detailed. And I can see this gal getting on this big hot air balloon and the hot air balloon's going up in the air and she's kind of freaked out by it. But then Jesus is in the hot air balloon with her and the hot air balloon descends and, and she's, you know, getting real peaceful. And then they land and they go out into this beautiful golden field and Jesus flips out a blanket and serves her a picnic. And I'm like, this is, this is just in my mind. I'm like, this has got to be the weird burrito I just ate for dinner. This is weird. I'm like, I don't want to share this with her. This is so out of my comfort zone. But I'm like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to risk it. Uh, and it's, a, it's an environment of love and humility and care and trying to just be a blessing. And so I said, I, I, I'm just going to go for it and share this with her. So I share it with her. And I ask her, does this resonate with you? She's like, no, not really at all. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay. And she's like, yeah, um, I actually hate heights and that whole balloon thing. Nope. And you'd never get me in one of those. And nope, that really doesn't mean anything. And I'm like, okay, well, bless you. I guess I missed it, you know. Uh, you know what's fun about this story is this gal, she's actually on staff at New Heights. 
And so um, I got to, I got to, um, I said, you know, she's just like, I'll, I'll go home and I'll pray about it, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, just how you test, test these, these types of words. She's like, I'll go home and pray about it. And I'll ask God for confirmation. If there's anything in it, God, could you confirm it? I'm not kidding you guys. She had some dramatic confirmations and intersections with some people, with some words that like filled in that story. And then she started to walk through some life experiences and she goes, oh my gosh, that entire thing was from God. And this means this, and that meant that, and this means this. And it just lit her up. And she's like, oh my gosh, I just feel so loved on by God. But in the moment, I was like, I've completely blown it and missed it, you know, but um, so anyway, so we have to, we have to say, take risks. Here's the deal. I believe that those of us who take risks with God will start to begin to hear his voice more frequently and we'll become more familiar with it um, if we'll step out. And scripture teaches us, you guys, not to despise prophecy, uh, and sometimes I think the reason why people despise prophecy is because of fear. They're like, man, I have fear that I'll miss it. Or what if somebody else misses it? Or what if somebody uses prophecy to manipulate somebody or to stoke their own ego, you know, to look more sp spiritual or whatever? Because that sadly does happen uh, with people. And that's why the, the scriptures teach us not to despise prophecy, not to shut it down, but to weigh it. Let's look at some more scripture here. So this is 1 Corinthians 14, 29. It says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. And so, so they're sharing. And here's the deal. The people in the community, they know this is coming through a human filter. So they're going, okay, let's see, does this fit? And we'll talk about how to test a little more specifically in a second. Um, but they're sitting with it. And let's also look likewise at 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. It says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. So hold on to the good and throw out the bad. And, uh, and so here's the deal. For the recipient of the prophetic word, it should be freely received, but weighed carefully. So freely receive it, but weigh it carefully. And so how do we weigh uh, I'm going to give us a couple of ways and then uh, just uh, kind of a pro tip. <laughs> uh, so here's the first and most important question that we need to ask is, does this word align with scripture? God is never going to say anything prophetically through somebody else that counters scripture. And so that is your first and primary test. That's got, why we need to know the Bible. Uh, it, we, need to, we need to also check ourselves uh, to go, man, is what I'm sharing, does this line up with scripture? Uh, but, but we test it that way. And if somebody gives you a word and it's leading you to sin, uh, you go, nope, uh, that is definitely not God. Thank you very much. Um, so always does it align with scripture. And then does it sound like Jesus? Does it sound like how Jesus would speak in the gospels? Does it, does it have his resonance, his consistency, his tone? Again, that's why we need to know the words of Jesus in the Gospels. But, but does, it, does it sound like him? Uh, and, and another way that I don't have here on the screen is does it fit? Does it actually fit? Meaning, does it resonate with this person? Let me tell you a story about just uh, testing and just asking the question, does it fit? So about eight or nine years ago, we were having a New Heights staff meeting. And, and if you've never been to one of our staff meetings, uh, it's usually just a big circle and we'll have a time of worship on the front end and then we'll have a time of prayer. Usually our New Heights staff meetings are like a big prayer meeting with like business mixed in, uh, but we will have a time of prayer. Uh, sometimes we'll be going through a book together and, and then we talk about, you know, different things in the church. We used to have our staff meetings over in the New Heights, I mean, in the Fayetteville prayer room across the street. And one day I went to staff meeting and you never really knew from week to week what the agenda was going to be. You know, Jim would do something and Lee would do something and Jim would do something. And this one day we go in and it's Jim's week. And uh, during worship, I see that there's this guy uh, who I've never seen before, just kind of hanging out in the room. And he's just kind of, it looks like he's praying with his eyes open. 
you know, and, um, and he's just kind of in the room. And I'm like, who's this guy? Never seen him before. Worship gets done. And Jim goes, hey, everybody, I want to introduce you to my friend Dave. So, so my friend Dave, uh, he is, is very um, experienced with the gift of prophecy. And I've invited him to come in and to be open to God giving prophetic words uh, to our staff. And really what we want to do is we want to just normalize the gift of the prophetic in our staff, in our church. And so this guy, Dave, uh, is going to share a little bit and then he's going to share some things. Um, and what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to test the things that he shares in community. Like as he shares something, we're going to go, does this fit with what we know about so-and-so and, and where, you know, wh what we feel like God is doing in so-and-so's life. So, so he introduces Dave. And so Dave, Dave gets up there and he's like, yeah, during worship, and he's real low key. He's real soft spoken. He's real low key, uh, really kind of a, kind of a coolster. And uh, he's like, as, as uh, we were worshiping, it's like, yeah, God was just uh, showing me some things for different people in the room here. And so we're just going to take some time and I'm going to share those things and we'll just see if those things fit. And so he starts off with uh, this guy named Josh who now is the head pastor of New Heights Bentonville. At that time, he was still our youth pastor. And he starts sharing some things about Josh. And it, it was some pretty specific stuff. Um, and he shares some of these specific things, that just some, some things to encourage Josh, some things that God is maybe wanting to confirm or say to Josh about things going on in his life. And then he asks Josh, he's like, does that resonate? Does that fit with you? And Josh goes, man, does it ever? And then he asks the rest of us, does this fit with what you guys know about Josh? Is it consistent? And we're like, yeah, it really does. This is like, okay, let's do another one. And he goes to Nathan Allen, who if you guys know who Nathan Allen is, so he's our global pastor. And for the longest time, he was like our resident Holy Spirit skeptic uh, and uh, definitely not his his Baptist background and uh, just his comfort zone. Um, but he's open. I love this about Nathan. He's very teachable. He's very open. Uh, and he starts sharing some words with Nathan. And as soon as he starts in on Nathan, I'm like, oh man, like this is spot on. Cause, and I'm like, Nathan really needs to hear this. You know And I'm like? This is really good. Uh, and he shares all this stuff with Nathan. And then he asks Nathan, does this, does this resonate? Does it fit? And he's like, yeah, it really does. I think Nathan, of course, he cries like Jim Hall. So, you know, he's getting teared up even as, as, as Dave's talking to him. And, and he asks us, does this fit? And we're like, yeah, that really fits Nathan. And then he does a few more. He does Lee Epstein. He just, I'm like, man, this guy is hearing from God. And he's real low key. He's real humble. Um, and it was powerful, y'all. And there were people in our, in our staff, because we come from all different church backgrounds, uh, some of us are more comfortable and familiar with the gifts of the Spirit, and some definitely not so much. Um, it was just fun. It was really, but we just, we had this sense, God is here, and He sees us, and He loves us, which we're going to talk about, um, why this is so important with this gift. Uh, and then everybody's leaving, and I, you know, you kind of have that hope in the back of your mind, dang, I wanted Him to do me, right, you know? But you're trying not to be selfish, and you're trying to just bless other people and stuff. And so we're all leaving the prayer room to go into this other room to have our staff meeting. And I'm one of the last people out. And he goes, hey, you. He's like, don't leave. And uh, got something for you. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so everybody leaves. And he's like, have a seat here. And so we sit down at this little table. There's, a, you know, two chairs here. And so you guys, I'm in the prayer room alone with Dave the prophet, right? And I'm like, what's going to happen? And, uh, and I start to introduce myself to him and tell him who I am. And he's like, no, no, don't tell me anything. He's like, let me just listen. And I was like, okay. So he closed his eyes. And he's quiet for a little bit. And he starts going, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, and, and I'm just like, I'm, just, I'm going crazy. Uh, so he's quiet for like a couple of minutes. And then he's like, I've got a few things for you. And I was like, can I write this down? I always think it's good in times like this when you know it's coming to like get your phone and record or uh, get a pen and write some things down. Uh, 
And he started to say something. The very first thing he said out of his mouth, I was like, this guy's a prophet. He's hearing from God. He knew something. It was literally like he had been in my quiet time that week, literally. Um, and he knew some things about uh, this, this thing that I, me and God were talking through and working through. And, and, and I was like, this guy is hearing from God. And he shared a few other things with me. I wrote it all down. And some of it had to do with some things that um, I was experiencing then, but also some things that maybe were going to happen in the future. I wrote it all in my journal. I found that journal uh, just about a year, year and a half ago, and I went back to it. You guys, every single thing that he told me has come to pass. Everything. Uh, it's amazing. Um, so this guy was very skilled uh, in his gift with the prophetic, which I'm going to talk about at the very end tonight. If you want to grow in this, what are some ways to grow in this gift? Last thing is to ask for confirmation. Uh, and so this is, I don't think this is testing God. This is not quite the same as putting out a fleece for God. People sometimes use that type of language. Um, but I like to go to God and go, okay, especially if something comes out of the blue. Like if somebody says, I think God is saying you're going to move to China. Okay, if I have not been hearing that from God myself, and it comes out of the blue from somebody else, even somebody, maybe a pastor or somebody with authority in my life, you know what I do with that if it's out of the blue? I kind of put it in a box over here on a shelf, which is my questions for God's confirmation box. And I'll just kind of go, God, that whole thing, I don't know. Now, if that's you, you can confirm that in any way you want. And I'll move on it if you can confirm it in a way that I can understand. But I'm not moving on it till you confirm it. And so I think it's very good uh, if you get something and you're like, I'm not sure. Like my friend who I said I shared that word with her and she was like, eh, um, she got the confirmation. And so sometimes I think it's okay to say, God, could you please confirm this to me in a way that I can understand? All right. I told you guys that I would answer the question, how is prophecy different from teaching? Let's answer this quickly. John chapter 14, verse 26 Jesus said, but the advocate, other translations say the comforter, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he'll remind you of everything that I have said to you. So the primary role of the prophetic is to reveal God to the human heart. It's to reveal God to the human heart. Because teaching is a gift which God uses a human voice to tell people about God in his ways and his character, like I'm doing tonight. He's, I hope he's using me. Uh, I believe he is a human voice to, to teach you guys about God, his character, his ways, his nature. Um, so I'm telling you about these things. Prophecy is a gift where God uses a human voice to show people his intimate care and intimately show them who he is in his character. So, so teaching is more about telling prophecy is more about showing. Um, sometimes God can speak audibly, but I don't think that is his preferred method of speaking. I think most often the way God wants to speak is through a whisper, through a whisper. Uh, and, and yes, I love, I love good preaching. I love good teaching. I love good sermons. Um, I need the whisper of God because, because he whispers because of intimacy. It's because of intimacy. It's, it's almost like when God is whispering to you, it's like he's leaning in. Kind of like an intimate friend would just kind of lean in and whisper in your ear. It's like, sure, our friends can communicate just loud. I'm kind of a loud person. Uh, but, but man, you know, intimate friends or even my wife will just lean in and whisper in my ear. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I need to hear that. Because it's one thing for a preacher or a teacher to tell you that God loves you. It's another thing when somebody comes up and they share a message that they, they say they believe is from God. And they say, I just think right now, God wants you to know that he loves you. And what's fun about this is a lot of the time, 
when those words come, if we're open to them, they're kind of at the exact time we need to hear that thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, I really need to hear that right now. Or it confirms things that you feel like God has been saying to you. Uh, and it's that outside voice. It's almost like that third party voice that comes in, you know, and, and it's, it just speaks to you in that moment. And what happens when you get a word like that? And if anybody has ever received something like this, you just have this feeling, God sees me right now. Like he sees me, he knows me, he knows what I'm going through, and he loves me. And Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says that the love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The love of God gets poured out in our hearts. And so what the Spirit does is he takes a doctrine or a truth that you already believe about God, and what he does is he turns it into a revelation that you get to experience and live from. He'll do that through prophetic words. It goes from a doctrine you know to an experience that you start to just live out of. Um, so another way of saying it is God set, you know, the scriptures say God is love. The spirit makes it real to me. It pour, he pours his, the love of God out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Another way of thinking about prophecy in the Old Testament, prophecy was about Jesus, and it was looking forward. Prophecy was all about uh, pointing to Jesus when he would eventually show up. But New Testament prophecy is different because what it is, is it's revealing Jesus in the context of my everyday life now. So G the Spirit takes from Jesus and all that he said and done and who he is, and he applies it and makes it real in my life today. And it just plunges right through my intellect into the depths of, of my heart. So that's why we need um, to be open to God communicating to us and speaking to us in this way of the Spirit. So here's what I want to wrap up tonight. Um, is I'm hoping, just from seeing the biblical basis and casting some vision, that you're going, okay, I want to grow in the prophetic. I want to, I want to become a person who learns to recognize uh, God's voice and, and recognize the activity of the Spirit when He's trying to show and do stuff. And I also want to become a good conduit of God's heart to others. So if that's you, if you're like, if your faith is rising and you're like, I want to grow in this, I want to experience it, I want more, I'm just going to uh, give us a few ways uh, to grow in these things. Uh, and number one is we need desire. We need to desire it. 1 Corinthians 14.1, which we already looked at, says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, but especially that you would prophesy. So eagerly desire to hear God and then be, have the boldness and the courage to share that with others. What does that word eagerly mean? So in the original Greek language, uh, the word used for eagerly here, it kind of translates in English to set one's heart on. It's like I'm making this my pursuit. I'm set, you ever set your heart on something? It's like I'm looking forward to that thing, whatever it is, you know, whether it's a day at the spa or it's a day on the lake or it's, you know, fishing or golfing or whatever. It's like, Mm, I am setting my heart on that thing. I'm like on my weather app, making sure the weather's going to be good. You know, I'm getting my stuff together. I am amped. I'm ready. I'm eager about that thing. This is kind of the idea of this eagerly desire. Uh, it also means to be deeply committed to. So by inspiration of the Spirit, Paul is saying to us, eagerly desire. Set your heart on, be deeply committed to uh, growing in the prophetic. And what we're talking about with deeply desiring is not hype. It's not hype. I have no interest in hype um, or, or emotionalism, but I am looking for every inkling of how God may be wanting to communicate to me. And I think that's the key here tonight is, is am I open Am I just looking for any inkling that he may be speaking to me? Um, so I, I, can, I can desire, but, but I want to encourage you to go beyond desire. And you can pray for desire. God, give me a desire because I might not have it tonight. Give it to me because that's the next part of this is to ask God for these gifts. To ask him, God, I, I want to hear your voice more. 
uh, I want to become familiar with it. And, and, I, and I want to be able to move in the gift of, of prophecy. Uh, and here's the thing about asking, is you're not asking for more like technique, because this is a gift of the Spirit. It's not, it's not a technique, um, but it's a gift to receive. So ask Him. I, I think it's a prayer that He loves to answer. Uh, he tells, I think it's always God's will to pray God's Word. So when He says eagerly desire, I think ask Him for it. Here's another key, though, is to have a learner's heart. To have a learner's heart. And this is a challenge for some of us, especially those of us in the room who are uh, perfectionists. <laughs> I, uh, one of my, uh, I have uh, a family member who they're just like, I don't want to try nothing until I have like money back guarantee success that I'm going to crush it and hit a home run. Like, so, so you know, I'm, I'm just going to, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, but here's the deal. We have to have a learner's heart uh, and just go, Lord, I can be humble about this. I don't know much or anything, but I want to grow and I want to take baby steps. I want to share another story with you. It's actually from scripture and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter three. And it's the story of the young boy Samuel with the priest Eli. So if you remember, Samuel's story is a little boy. His mom kind of has this miraculous pregnancy. Uh, Samuel's born. Uh, out of answer to a prayer and she dedicates him to the Lord and he's like this little like you know he, he works at the temple or at the you know he works like kind of like where the the altar was at that time there really wasn't tabernacle temple yet but but he was working with sort of this this high priest Eli and Samuel hears the voice of the spirit in the middle of the night and you remember the story what happens so God speaks to Samuel, and Samuel does not recognize God's voice. And so he thinks it's Eli. And so he goes running in the other room. He's like, Eli. He wakes up the old man. He's like, did you, did you call me? And Eli, Eli's like, kid, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down and let me sleep. So little Samuel goes back and lays down. Voice of God comes a second time. Runs into Eli. Eli, did you call me? No, kid. Go back to sleep. Third time happens again. This time, Eli's sort of cluing in. God's talking to the kid. And he says this, and I think it's a very important posture for us in this entire discussion. He says, next time you think you're hearing that, he says, say this, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Man, I think what a great posture. And so he, Samuel goes back and he says that, and then God has a conversation with Samuel. You know what's so comforting about this story? Samuel did not recognize God's voice. He had to learn. There was a learning curve for him. And as you look at the life of Samuel, as he gets older, look through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, through those books, later in his life, he is a prophet from God, and he's just getting downloads. He's just getting downloads from heaven. And one day he gets a download from heaven I want you to go to this town called Bethlehem. There's a guy there named Jesse. One of his sons is going to be the next king of Israel. Samuel shows up. He steps out on what he thinks the Spirit's saying, shows up in Bethlehem, and he immediately gets it wrong. I, I, I kind of take some sort of weird uh, you know, comfort from it because um, he sees the oldest and he goes, this has surely got to be the next king. And God goes, nope, it's not him. I've rejected that one. Because God looks at the heart, not at the external. So Samuel's still not getting it 100% right, but he does hear this little boy David is going to be the next king and he anoints him. So I just love just that storyline of Samuel because it just encourages me just to go, I want to be teachable. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Another uh, thing that's important for us in growing in all of this is to make ourselves available. Next week, you guys are going to meet my friend Kimberly. And she leads a really cool ministry at New Heights called The Fount. And The Fount basically is a group in community who take, ev they take everything that I'm teaching you guys tonight and they just start to learn more and practice and wait on God and share what they think God is saying. 
and it's beautiful. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Kimberly. She leads that ministry. She's going to come in with uh, some of the found, the people that are going through that next week to be with us in our experience. Um, my friend Kimberly, I love her for all sorts of different reasons. She is just, she lives constantly just available. It's almost sort of like, like her radar sweep, you know? It's like, it's always on. She's always sort of looking for just, God, is there anything you want me to, you want to say to me or through me to anybody? She'll stop strangers on the street. She'll take the risks. She'll share, share stuff with people all over. But she's always on assignment on Sunday mornings at our church. Uh, even just this last Sunday, I was getting ready to get up on stage and preach. Next thing I know, I got this little tap on my shoulder. It's Kimberly. She's like, I think God has a word for you. And she shares this thing with me. And man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, whoa. I mean, I was just so in that moment, just filled with God's presence and so encouraged. Uh, and what she shared actually happened uh, on Sunday morning. It was powerful. But she just goes to church on assignment. She's just like, I'm just open. Anybody? And she'll just go up to just random people in our congregation and do it very humbly. Hey, I'm Kimberly, and I think God has a word he wants me to share with you. Would you be open to that? And she'll share it with them and then pray for them. One of the cool things about Kimberly is the reason she's so passionate about this is the very first Sunday, her and her husband, he's a professor in the business college uh, at the University of Arkansas. So they had moved here from Georgia, where he was a professor at another school, uh, and he came here to, to Arkansas. And I'll just, she shares this story. She's like, our first two weeks in Arkansas were rough. I mean, like rough. All sorts of things circumstantially went wrong, things with the move, things with the house. I mean, it was, it was a challenge. And they, they found New Heights Church, and they just showed up on a Sunday, uh, and and they were like, we're just here. We don't know. And they were very discouraged, even thinking about, did we miss God? And should we move back to Georgia? She said that Sunday morning, a gentleman came up to her and her husband at the end of the service. And he said, hey, you don't know me. My name is so-and-so. Um, I think God has something, a word that he wants to share with you. Can I share it with you? And, and he shares this word with them. And it was the word of the Lord that they hadn't missed it. He didn't know him from Adam, right? You know, <laughs> they'd never seen him. He'd never seen them. But it was literally specifics, just almost like God was just reading their mail. Uh, and, and he shared this word with them. They're in tears. Uh, and they're like, yes, um, God has called us here. And now they have, they've stayed and they help me lead our deeper ministry. She leads our fount ministry. They're incredible servants in our church. Um, so... Um, just be open and be available in any way God wants to use you. A uh, couple more here is to do uh, what my friend Kimberly does and what my, some of my uh, you know, friends do and I try to do is just begin to start to pray for others, but pray for others in this way. When somebody gives you a prayer request, pray for the specifics that they give you, um, but be open for the Spirit to lead you to details that maybe they didn't share. Because it says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, because we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself helps us. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody, they ask for prayer and they're like, man, pray, just pray for our marriage. It's just crazy right now. And I can't share her a lot, but just pray for us. And, and then they're gone. And then you're like, okay, uh, God, I just pray that um, you would just help them and that you would just be with them and you'd bless them and help them and be with them and bless them and help them and be with them. And what's just happened? You've just run out of information. Does that mean you need to stop praying? So this is where I'll start to, even as I pray for people, I'll do this on Sunday mornings at New Heights when I pray for people. I'm praying for their thing that they're asking. But even as I'm praying, I'm silently praying, is there more, God? Is there more? Is there anything else? And sometimes just other thoughts will just start to come into my mind. And I'll be like, and Lord, I just pray for those finances. Well, they didn't ask to pray for the finances, but that's what I'm Getting in my mind. And I pray for that fear. 
and I pray for those kids, you know, and I'll just start to pray for specifics. And so many times uh, I'll do this, not every time, but so many times they'll be like, man, thank you so much for praying for that, that little extra at the end. That's what I really needed. And because the spirit can lead us to details. And I love to do this when I'm praying for people, just also when I'm listening to people. I call it um, praying or listening with horses' ears. You ever seen horses' ears, how they're omnidirectional? How like, you know, a horse can have one ear out here. I used to ride horses uh, and trail ride. And so like, you know, they got one ear out here listening for, you know, rattlesnakes or cougars or whatever, but they got one ear back to you. You can actually talk to your horse, make noises to them and stuff. And they're listening to you and they're listening out here. And I like to just think of it this way. I want to have one ear to the person and one ear to heaven. And so it's just a great way to learn to become familiar with uh, God uh, speaking and leading us. And the last thing uh, is just to practice. Spiritual gifts grow in power and effectiveness the more we use them. They grow more as we use them. And it's kind of the old saying, too, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, they, can, they can get rusty. Uh, and so, so practicing, hearing the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, um, we, we, need to, we need to build, I think, some intentional things into our lives. I'll, I want to give you just a couple little practicals, and then, and then we'll be done here. A couple practicals. Um, you might try this. If you have like a morning quiet time, or maybe you have an evening quiet time, where you just have some carved out time for prayer, uh, you read the Bible, you go through your prayer, whatever. At the very end, try to add one minute to the end of your quiet time and go, God, is there anything you want to say to me today? Anything at all you want to say to me specifically? No agenda, just anything you want to say to me. And then just be quiet for a minute. You're not trying to hear something, but just see. Just experiment. See if anything comes to mind. Uh, so that's something that I would encourage you to try. Another thing too, guys, with learning to walk in the Spirit is we need to make ourselves available to Him. <laughs> so I pray every single morning. I sometimes do this before my feet ever hit the floor. I just, it's my first prayer. Holy Spirit, fill me and lead me today. Fill me and lead me afresh today. Now, do I have all of the Spirit when I wake up in the morning? Yes. I want Him to have all of me. And, and he really likes it when we let him lead, when we yield to him, when we say, Lord, I'm open, I'm available, take charge. He likes it when we surrender to him. So I'll say, Holy Spirit, fill me and lead me afresh today. And then I'll just roll out into my day and, uh, and just looking um, for his guidance. Another real last practical. Next time you're in a tough situation or kind of any situation and you don't have the answer, try this. God. Is there anything I need to know? And is there anything I need to do? Simple prayer. But Lord, anything I need to know, anything I need to do, and then just be quiet for a minute and see if anything comes to mind. And so these are just a couple little practical ways for us to learn to become familiar with him and his leading. Next week is going to be really fun. Please come back next week because uh, my friend Kimberly and the Fount and some others will be here. And it is such an amazing time. Uh, you might be a little bit nervous. Don't be. Um, please don't let anything keep you from coming next week. Uh, you will be incredibly blessed every time. And I've literally taken hundreds of people through what we're going to do next week. I've taken hundreds of people in our church through this. And every time they go, man, that was so encouraging. That was just, 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 I just, I mean, God, God does just fun, fun stuff. Um, people always feel closer to him when we're done, uh, more in tune with his heart, and actually closer to one another because it, it's, it's experiencing God's heart together in community. All right, you guys, let me pray for us, and, uh, and we'll be done for the evening. Father, I just thank you so much for my friends tonight. Uh, again, just being able just to sit and to learn uh, from you and your word and your ways. And I just pray for all of us that we would learn to, as it says in Galatians 5, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, walk with the Spirit. 
and that we would become familiar with the shepherd's voice. You said your sheep know your voice. So help us to be humble. Help us to be learners. Uh, help us to practice and make ourselves available. And it is so exciting, the life that you have for us. When we start to live this way, uh, not just in our own uh, intellect and power, but uh, with the Spirit's help, the Helper's help, it, life just, just, it, it just gets so fun. So I just pray that you would take my friends uh, deeper in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.